Claire Oliveros, our Vice President uh, for CRC, um, for Institutional Equity, Research and Planning, to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Thank you so much, Raul. And we, we are going to record this afternoon's uh, conversation and, and presentation with Dr. Robin Rodriguez. Um, please help me give also a, a warm welcome and round of applause to our inaugural director, Raul Pasamonte of the uh, Anna PC Grant and Apita Hawk Center. Thank you so much, Raul, for organizing and leading the three part speaker series for the 30th anniversary of Philippinex, Filipino, Filipina American History Month. Uh, we also would not be here if it wasn't for your leadership to make today possible. And welcome friends, colleagues, community members, guests, partners, co-conspirators. It's wonderful to have you join us this afternoon for um, our, our part two of the FAM speaker series with our distinguished, esteemed speaker, Dr. Robin Rodriguez. And what we know about Dr. Robin Rodriguez from her bio is that she is a renowned international scholar, author, activist, professor, um, coming to us from the esteemed Asian American Studies Department at UC Davis, founding director of the Bulusan Center for Filipino Studies at UC Davis, and uh, also has written many books and um, is, oh, an, right. is a, a renowned um, activist and community leader and partner right here in our region, Elk Grove, Sacramento. What you may not know about Dr. Rodriguez is that she's also extended her professorship, if you will, to be the people's professor. And she launched the School for Liberating Education and has made Filipino American studies and Asian American courses available to the masses. And more recently has embarked on an enterprise of cultivating a farm and supporting black indigenous people of color farmers in, in this collective effort that is um, actually going to be open and launching later this um, this fall, which I think we'll learn more about from Dr. Rodriguez's talk today. But um, what I think is also most important <laughs> is, that, is that Dr. Rodriguez is going to be speaking today about the um, intersection of activism and anti-martial law and also her own journey and along with her late son's journey uh, to activism in and an, around anti-martial um, law activism. Um, so please help me welcome Dr. Robin Rodriguez and there will be time for Q&A at the end, but it is my esteemed honor and pleasure to introduce not only my colleague, but also friend and Kasama sister, Robin Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez, welcome. We're so thrilled you're here with us. Again, CRC as your extended extended family and community to be with us as part of our FAM speaker series. Oh, thank you so much for giving me uh, yet another opportunity to address the CRC community. You know, uh, the Belusan Center for Philippinic Studies doesn't just have interns from the University of California, Davis, but we have interns from all over, including many students from CRC and many students from CRC end up coming to UC Davis. So I feel a really close uh, connection to the campus, um, not just institutionally, but of course, very personally, uh, given our, our long friendship to uh, uh, Dr. Olivero. So um, story, I, I love that we have a, an intimate group here imagine that we're sort of all gathered together around a, a big dining table. Uh, that is one way I love to, to create community is over food. So let me just start with a story. And actually, I'll, I have some fun um, slides that I will also share. But I just want to start with my family's migration story. And I'm going to start with my dad, Ruben Rodriguez. Ruben Rodriguez, my father was Scott. Born in the Philippines, he arrived in the United States just months before I was born. My pregnant mom had arrived in the United States before him. He was only about 25 years old. Ruben Rodriguez was not just, and you can kind of see it here, she has a little bump here. My mom, Christmas before I was born. Um, that's my dad. Um, Next to her, 
uh, Ruben Rodriguez would eventually become not just the stereotypical strict Filipino father, no makeup, no boyfriend, no friends, just study. He was that kind of a strict Filipino father. I, I joke that he was probably the prototype against which all strict Filipino fathers were just cheap imitations. Uh, Ruben Rodriguez could be scary. All my friends throughout middle school and high school, because yes, despite his restrictions, I still had friends, including boys and the occasional secret boyfriend. Um, they were all terrified of Mr. Rodriguez. Back when there were no cell phones and just house phones, anyone who tried to call my house would hang up if they heard my dad answer. Only the brave few would actually ask for me, but if they didn't ask properly, um, you know, my dad had a real like he had he had a, an idea about like what it meant to be at, to ask for me properly. May I please, Mr. Rodriguez? May I please speak to Robin? If they didn't ask in that way, if they instead asked, "Is Robin there?" He would hang up on them. <laughs> my dad would even send my little brother to spy on me after school to make sure I was actually at the student government or other club activities I, I said I was at. Not gonna lie, I did often, I mean, sometimes lie about where I was. <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez was the kind of strict Filipino with that kind of strict Filipino dad. Whenever he was especially frustrated with me, my dad would say in his heavily accented English, you know, you're very lucky. I arrived here on September 20th, 1972 just the day before martial law. Imagine, what if my ticket was the next day? Marcos declared martial law on September 21st. I would be stuck in the Philippines. You wouldn't even have a dad. I would have joined the activists. You would have seen me throwing rocks at the police and military like on TV too. Imagine, I only came with $100 in my pocket, but now we have all this. Like a lot of second generation Filipino Americans, people born in the United States to parents who immigrated from the Philippines, I often paid very little attention to my parents' stories. The Philippines was such a very far away place, the place everyone seemed to want to escape, the place where relatives who couldn't escape asked for money or boxes, but like buy in boxes, boxes of canned goods, chocolate, shampoo, and lotion. The Philippines seemed to be the source of the culture that made my dad so difficult. Growing up, I didn't think, I didn't think very much of my dad's migration story. It took Filipino American studies for me to fully appreciate my dad's story, to come to a place of healing and forgiveness toward him, to get me questioning a little bit more the reasons why and how it was that I, a brown girl came to be growing up in America. You know, there's often this term that's, that's thrown around a lot during Filipino American History Month, no history, no self. It's a phrase that invites us to consider always that who we are is fundamentally a consequence of history and that understanding our history can shape our future. I start with the story of my dad for a couple of reasons. First, I really wanna illustrate the ways that Filipino American studies starts with us, every single one of us. We are all people who have very unique biographies, unique biographies that are fundamentally important to document and share. It's not just the stories of those who achieve the most, the stories of presidents or CEOs or so-called VIPs that deserve remembering, even just of me. Presidents, CEOs, VIPs, now those are the types of people that historians in this country have typically focused on. And given that this country is one that is deeply shaped by white supremacy, since so few of our people have had the opportunity to be presidents, CEOs, or VIPs, then it meant that we, were always just barely, just barely a footnote if we existed at all in any history or social studies books. Filipino American studies exist because 50 years ago, people in our community, young college students like some of you, 
deeply believe that we, you, me, our community matter, that we as a people have value, that all our stories need to be told. Where there were no history books yet, Filipino Americans who fought for and created Filipino American studies started at home with the stories of their parents, just the way I did here. Ooh, there. Today, <laughs> I will be telling you a series of stories from my life because Filipino studies, as it's developed since its beginnings 50 years ago, has been an integral part of my life. I myself am approaching 50 just in a couple months. Filipino American studies started just before I was born. Just as importantly, I am directly connected to the people who founded it the very first people who fought for and taught Filipino American studies would end up teaching me. And they were the ones who sent me on a path to becoming a professor, writing extensively on Filipino, uh, the Filipino experience and creating the Volusan Center for Filipinx studies. It's really important to note that many of the people who came before me, who did the work of fighting for and teaching Filipino American studies because they were lovers of justice, what motivated them to do what they did was their desire to right the wrongs of our absence in history books. But because they were lovers of justice for our people, they were also very involved in the fight against martial, uh, fight against martial law in the Philippines. The declaration of which uh, by President Ferdinand Marcos occurred 50 years ago last month. It's a really significant period of time, 50 years of many, many things. Uh, martial law had a major impact on my mentors and me, and that's a theme that will also come up today. I could have probably uh, done a talk that focuses on my research. After all, I have published quite a bit. Uh, Y'all can find my books on my website, drrobinrodriguez.com, um, and hopefully I can do a better job about posting from my publications and teaching on my Instagram accounts, which are uh, mad professora or liberating dot education. But um, today, uh, on this occasion, as we celebrate 50 years of Filipino American studies, rather than tell you about my research as a Filipino American studies professor, I just thought it would be important to go back to where we started as a field in our stories. So this is just an overview of um, my talk. I'm going to be talking about kind of my origin story in Filipino American studies. I'll talk about Filipino American studies and student activism uh, as I uh, was involved uh, very active uh, as a college student first and then a graduate student. I'll talk a little bit about the building of Filipino studies in academia and the, specifically the story of the Bulosan Center. And then I'll talk about Filipino American studies across generations from um, me as a mother to my sons with a special focus on my late son Amato. Okay, origin stories. So I grew up pretty familiar, uh, pretty firmly Filipino. I knew what I was. And though, as I talked about it earlier, sometimes I felt it was an identity that caused me some anxiety and hardship. It was also an identity I really, really cared about. I loved, love Filipino food. I mean, I love it. I mean, you can kind of see here, <laughs> that's me. Um, these are like neighborhood kids because the Union City where I grew up was predominantly Filipino. Um, and uh, yeah, I love Filipino food. And one of my most favorite memories as a little girl when I was uh, with my dad is that he took me to San Francisco to try chocolate meat or dinuguan which is trigger warning for folks. It's made from pork blood, but I still love it. But I just remember that story when my dad took me when I was about this age here in this top left picture. Um, I loved it from the very first moment I tried it. Uh, you can see I was a very healthy girl, uh, fed lots healthy amounts of Filipino food by my grandma, my Lola. I love the loudness of my Filipino family when they gathered. Um, and you'll see that picture there. And this is me here, if you can kind of see me sitting down. Um, <laughs> though there weren't a lot of us, my parents' siblings had actually stayed back in the Philippines for the most part. 
and our relatives are mainly extended family members of cousins and second cousins. I loved laughing and teasing during endless rounds of karaoke. And you know, back in the day, y'all don't even know this. They used to call it minus one. <laughs> you used to have this album that just had these like um, the, just the music, and you had to read the lyrics on the back of the of the of the album. But um, we know it now as karaoke, but I, I could understand Tagalog and I enjoyed watching all the corny Filipino comedies when we would get them on beta. Yeah, y'all, you don't even know what a Betamax is or VHS. Um, at some point, I noticed, though, that there was a disconnect between the fact that I lived in a predominantly Filipino neighborhood, but rarely, rarely encountered anything about Filipinos in the books at school and certainly not in the media. I was an avid reader. I've always been kind of a nerd. I read novels partly to avoid household chores because Ruben, man, he would wake us up early in the morning on a Saturday to do chores all day, all the entire weekends. So I would say, daddy, I'm reading, I'm reading. I cannot, I cannot mop the floor. Um, so I read, I read lots of novels, but I also remember being super excited because again, I was sort of a nerd about the, um, when my parents bought an encyclopedia for the very first time. For all of you who don't know this, there were these books, these volumes organized by letters around all sorts of topics that you looked up by word and before Wikipedia. Um, and when my parents bought that, I just, um, I was so excited and I, but I kind of knew on some level, though I was still kind of young and developing, I knew enough to recognize that all of those things, the novels I read and encyclopedias just lacked any kind of real Filipino presence. The martial law happened in the, was happening in the Philippines. Um, and when I was already kind of in uh, uh, late elementary school, um, that's really when the people uh, power struggle um, was happening. And, and that was exciting for me because that was about the only time, the only time growing up that the Philippines or brown people, Filipinos uh, were actually uh, getting any attention in the media. You could turn on the TV and all of a sudden there's all these people that look like me um, and they're all part of this incredibly historic moment trying to bring down this dictatorship. And then soon enough, books are being written about it too. My dad would buy them and they were some of the first books ever in our household that were focused on the Filipino experience um, that might even possibly be by Filipinos. I remember how powerful it, it was to feel like you feel like we were finally being seen as, as a people. You know, I remember as a sixth grader at the height of the anti-martial law movement when my cousins who had joined uh, the people power movement had actually mailed me this really bright yellow t-shirt uh, that was associated with the martial law movement. And I wore it to school. I mean, it was kind of like, you know, I mean, really loud yellow, <laughs> but I wore it anyway because I was so proud to be Filipino and to be proud to be connected to this historic movement on the verge of ending a dictatorship, uh, one that was it was getting so much uh, more attention um, in ways that I'd never seen Filipinos get attention before. Um, so, you know, when I first, my, in terms of just the first encounter with Filipino American studies was when I was in high school, this is when I was in high school, uh, but I didn't even know it yet. Um, I had a chance to participate in some of the Filipino Advocates for Justice. Uh, it's now called that, it's the FAJ, uh, which is an Oakland-based nonprofit. Uh, it might actually be the only nonprofit that serves um, Filipinos in the 510. Um, in the in the East Bay, uh, but I at the time it was called the Filipinos for Affirmative Action. But um, I I, part, part, I participated in a youth program um, at my high school at Logan that uh, was organized by what, by what we now know as the FAJ. And what was really really interesting is the staffers of this organization uh, were the ones who were. Uh, and who were creating this program uh, were actually the very same people responsible for creating Filipino studies. It was the founders of Filipino American studies who were committed to not, not just kind of uh, disseminating knowledge, but really kind of putting into practice, uh, creating programs that were gonna serve the community, including uh, youth like me, right? For, for them, for the founders of Filipino American studies, it was not something you just took in college, just got a grade for, and walked away from, it's just another course you check off. Um, 
as part of, you know, the diversity requirement to graduate, you know, it wasn't about that. For them, Filipino American studies was meant to give you the tools to truly uh, know yourself, to truly know where you came from and uh, for all of that and, and, and to be able to not have just all of that, but to, to have uh, the tools to try to better uplift our community. That's what Filipino American studies is about. So Lillian Galeto, uh, the longtime executive director of FAJ, was one of those who actually helped to establish Filipino American studies at UC Davis, where I work right now. Had it not been for the same woman, I would not have my job. Had it not been for that same woman, I would not have been in a program um, like this, where I met uh, here I'm with Pete Chimero, who is one of the founders of the Filipino American National Historical Society. Um, who is the organization um, that brought us Filipino American History Month? Uh, you know, I think it's really important to know. Yes, we celebrate Phil Am History Month, but who do you think gave it to us? Uh, the government just decided to declare it? No. The university decided to just recognize it? No. Um, we, we fought for Filipino American History Month, and specifically, it was funds that helped to, to do that. So, you know, I first encountered Philippine American studies in this program. Um, it was huge for me. I remember the conference, the, the title of the conference, it was, and Who Am I? And uh, among the things that it explored was the issue of identity among second generation Filipino Americans and how they negotiate issues with their immigrant parents. I mean, when I saw that, I was like, oh, 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 because I had been struggling so much um, with my father. And it was just, it felt so exciting to kind of have a conference that was really addressing the things that I was dealing with as a young person. It felt, again, good to be seen. And the speaker at the event, uh, Pete Chimero, um, you know, I never met anybody like that. I mean, the staffers at FAJ, people like Pete, I never met second generation um, Filipino uh, Americans who were like the age of my parents. You know, that I didn't even know that that was a thing, that there were actually people who were basically my parents' age who were born and raised in the U.S. It just nothing I never, I ever knew uh, actually existed. So um, this for me, uh, just really kind of, you know, encountering all of this for the first time. Um, you know, for me, encountering these people, being able to hear this topic, it suggested that there was a whole history out there that I was never aware of. And being denied that history angered me. I think, you know, really that became the spark in me to become uh, an activist. I remember writing to elected officials around this time about the need for more curriculum that reflected the experiences of people of color in our schools that could offer inspiration to all of us and maybe even, and, and perhaps even more importantly for the youth that uh, people in the school and local police believed to be troubled or troubling. You know, I thought that this was really a, a kind of education that could be so truly, truly um, empowering and liberating for all of us. Oh, okay, so this is sort of um, just college. So, uh, you know, the first time I really encountered Filipino American studies uh, in an actual classroom um, as part of the curriculum was after I had transferred to UC Santa Barbara. Uh, when I saw a course with Filipino in the title, um, along with other courses in ethnic studies, again, I was like, wow, a college course on Filipino American study? Of course I'm gonna sign up for that. And of course I'm gonna sign up for the courses with Chicano in the title, Black in the title, Asian American in the title. I took all of them. Um, but you know the Filipino uh, uh, American Studies course that that just opened up a whole new world to me. Again, a new world that I didn't know even existed. I had the privilege of learning Filipino American Studies from a professor John Cruz, who I know at some level was really teaching the course as a labor of love. I remember when he first screened the fall of the I Hotel, and I'm not going to be able to talk about it, but it's this incredibly powerful documentary that looks at early anti-gentrification and housing um, struggles in San Francisco from like the 1960s and 70s. That film, if you haven't watched it, you need to watch it. But I remember uh, Professor Cruz actually had to walk out of the classroom to gather himself because the film um, 
made him break down into tears. I'd never seen that before. Um, and of course, I would soon learn why when I watched it myself. It, it's such a powerful film. Um, but like Dr. Cruz, you know, and, and even now, I still, I still screen it. And every time I screen it, I'm always, always breaking down because um, it's just such a moving film. But Dr. Cruz's class transformed my life. We read lots and lots of, uh, of, of, of books in that class. Um, and, and the one with the lasting impact. And I think this may actually be the original book that I got, if you can see it. America's in the Heart is the book that really kind of deeply impacted me. When I read America's in the Heart, I couldn't believe that there was a book written by a Filipino about the Filipino experience in America that had been in existence for 50 years. And we're dealing with a lot of the, the number 50 here, but you know, that's how old the book was when I was in college in the early 90s. America's in the Heart was already 50 years old. Again, I only knew a Filipino experience um, in America as far back as my parents. And then of course, in high school, thankfully I met the FAJ folks. And then I started to learn a little bit more that extended just a little further. And then with America's in the Heart to, to know that there was an even further timeline and even older timeline um, of Filipinos in, in America. And um, again, you know, after some of the books that were starting to come out about the people power movement, um, that I kind of encountered a little bit in uh, middle school and then high school. This was really the first time I'd ever seen anything, a book on Filipinos uh, in America by a Filipino. So um, I don't know, this, the book, even though it had been around for several decades already, it still resonated with me. You know, I was so moved by the book that I literally gifted it to my brother right away. I just felt like it was just such an inspiration. And I didn't even just want to share it with my brother. I shared it with everybody. Uh, you see here a little article about me, but you know, I just, I needed to keep going with it. I, I felt like, I'm like, you know, just so inspired to keep um, sharing this new, new knowledge. And I connected with other students and youth across Southern California. And we trade, created a coalition to try to teach ourselves as much as we could. Cause you know, the only course uh, at Santa Barbara at the time, and probably still is, it's probably still the case was Dr. Cruz's course, just like here at UC Davis, the only course that has Filipino in the title is mine. Um, but, you know, I wanted to learn more. And um, I, I, you know, wanted to be able to, I worked with other youth uh, to do that. So we started to teach ourselves and, you know, um, as we taught ourselves and learned, we would teach others. We would organize forums, do all this sort of work. So I pretty much started teaching Philippine American studies even before I graduated from college. But Dr. Cruz really changed my life by extending knowledge I never knew existed. But he also showed me that I could follow in his footsteps to write and teach about Philippine American studies uh, as a professor myself. I mean, I should say that, you know, I wasn't even just only taking classes um, in, in uh, um, Asian American studies or on, you know, Filipino studies in this case. Uh, Professor Cruz's class, but I was really also learning a lot at um, forums about martial law from former political prisoners and other activists who were also doing a lot of this work um, in um, in extending knowledge about the Filipino experience um, off campus. So, um, oops. did I just lose something? I think I lost you. Okay, here we go. So, um, after I graduated from UC Santa Barbara, I moved back to the Bay Area after successfully getting accepted into the PhD program at UC Berkeley. Um, I was on my way to being a professor. I had the opportunity uh, while I was back in the Bay Area, back home, to meet elders who had been active in the anti-martial law movement um, at different educational forums that were available to uh, the public. And like my mentors at FAJ, uh, the ones that I met in high school, they emphasized the idea that uh, Filipino American studies isn't just about learning information about our community, but about putting those ideas into practice. In other words, Filipino American studies should inspire us to action. So I was learning from these uh, anti-martial law mentors that Martial law, even though it had ended with the people power movement, hadn't really quite ended. That in many ways, the, the country, the Philippines, continued to be 
a neo colony of the United States, and that corrupt politicians and greedy landlords continue to exploit and oppress the Filipino people. I'd never known this. I only learned a bit in Professor Cruz's class and was starting to learn more from some anti-martial law activists in Southern California, even more when I went to the Bay Area. And I was really encouraged by them to learn directly from social justice organizers in the Philippines and to see the conditions uh, suffered by the Filipino people myself. Um, and you see here, this is a picture of myself, of me. I cut my hair by then. <laughs> and I went to the Philippines for the first time as an adult at this time. And this is my really dear friend, uh, Raquel Redondez. And together we went to explore, um, you know, uh, what I would not just research as a scholar, but to learn from anti-martial law movement veterans who were continuing to organize uh, social justice uh, in, as part of the social justice movement in the Philippines. And, um, uh, when I was there, I, I felt so inspired. Both of us felt, felt incredibly inspired um, to, again, not just by, not to, to do something, right? It wasn't just that we were learning something new and encountering the Philippines as young adults, um, you know, in a new kind of way, but we wanted to be able to take action and help to build a movement supporting the Filipino struggle the Filipino people struggle for genuine democracy in the Philippines. Uh, and so um, after this initial trip early in my grad career, I came back and with Raquel, we formed the League of Filipino Students or LFS, which believe it or not still exists and is now in its 25th year. Um, when I finally finished my doctorate after I published other work, including my first book, Migrants for Export, How the Philippine State Brokers Labor to the World, I would actually go on to publish a book called Filipino American Transnational and Diasporic Activism. And that's where I kind of look at some of the impact of anti-martial law activism on, on other Filipino Americans like me. But you know, you see here just like a newspaper clipping um, from the Katipunan, um, just a, a group, uh, an, a, a newspaper that a young anti-martial law activists had had put together. And, and you know, these are the same people again, as I said, who really um, mentored me even at the end after uh, after martial law had ended in the Philippines. So fast forward, I got my PhD and I published some books and I got my first job at Rutgers. And then I eventually um, was able to come uh, get, get find my way back home to Northern California um, where I uh, and started teaching at UC Davis in 2011. So though I managed somehow to finish my PhD, get positions in relatively prestigious universities and publish, the truth is writing and teaching Filipino American studies is a constant battle. One thing um, I've learned just in launching this center is that we can't rely on the institution alone to help us address our issues and concerns. And of course, I wasn't just learning this in the context of uh, launching the Blue Sun Center, but truly um, looking at the example of, uh, of the early founders of Filipino American studies, it's clear that you cannot rely on the institution to um, address our issues and concerns and, and offer us uh, things like Filipino American studies. What's necessary is coordinated collective coalitional efforts uh, between um, those who have managed a, a to secure a place in the institution and um, uh, those, uh, those in the community, you know, and that's a, a key lesson we learned with the Filipino American uh, study struggle 50 years ago. It was students who managed to get in and have a, enjoy some relative privilege being part of the UC Davis community, but uh, they, they had to work alongside uh, other allies on campus and off campus to be able to fully establish uh, Asian American, uh, I'm sorry, Philippine American studies, but also Asian American studies more broadly. And we had to take those cues um, from them because um, we really would not have been able to, uh, to, to have a Bulusan Center if we had not organized as a community. You know, what's interesting is though I have all these letters after my name, though I've published very widely uh, so many times um, uh, when I've tried to apply for funding for for further research on the Filipino community. Um, I've often, often, uh, more often than not gotten rejection 
for uh, funding proposals to, to support research in Filipino studies. Literally, I've seen um, uh, rejection letters that say things like, who cares about Filipino studies? Who cares about the Philippines? Uh, where's the Philippines anyway? That's literally some things that sometimes like, you know, don't get written explicitly, but the sense that like, you know, um, people who are reviewing don't know or don't care. Um, and, you know, they make you feel like Filipino people are simply just unimportant. And so, you know, uh, being able to continue to do research in Filipino studies is nearly impossible. It has been almost nearly impossible for many of us. But uh, the Belusan Center, uh, what we did was, again, you know, drew from the examples of our, of our uh, predecessors and, um, you know, together uh, uh, created the, um, launched the center. Uh, what we did is, um, and I'll show you here, the center was made possible only by the critical mass of UC Davis affiliated faculty, staff, and students linked closely with the broader community and common purpose to support the documenting, preserving, and disseminating of our stories. So we literally started with like a community fundraiser in 2018. Um, <laughs> we had like, you know, my parents used to always go to dinner dances to raise money for the Philippines or something. We had a dinner dance, except this time, instead of ballroom dancing and line dancing, we had hip hop artists and spoken word artists and others. And folks came, they bought tickets, it was sold out. And for folks who couldn't come, they just donated anyway. And we ended up getting three times as much as our goal. And then not only that, we got people so fired up that uh, folks were down to go to the Capitol and not just lift up uh, the issues affecting Filipinos uh, so that our lawmakers in the Capitol would address them. But among the things that they address is just the need for Filipino studies. And with support from then uh, Assembly Member Rob Bonta, now Attorney General Rob Bonta, he helped us uh, find a, you know, understand the process and we fought and we won. Um, a, an allocation from the, from the state uh, to, to jumpstart Filipino studies. And um, really our continued existence since uh, we were launched in 2018 has, has been through first um, an investment from the California legislature. Then we were recognized for our work by the Hewlett Foundation uh, 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 because we had been doing so much work around anti-Asian hate. And you know, our future will really fully depend on um, the continued support of our community. Uh, but again, you know, we would not have existed. We would not exist without uh, organizing. I just want to kind of get close to the end of my talk, which is to really talk about kind of Philippine American studies across generations, um, from um, mother uh, to sons. You know, so I started with a story about my parent, my father and me a child and um, that impact, I kind of felt like it maybe made sense to then end out with a story as me now as a parent, a mother to children. Um, I wanted to close out um, this, uh, this, uh, this talk um, uh, about not just, well, not both of my children, but uh, one in particular, the older one here. So here on the left, you'll see, uh, this is my, young, my older son, Amato, when he was about uh, four years old. This was, uh, we were, I was um, a grad student at Berkeley at the time. This was during some of the big anti-war protests against uh, the war in Iraq, uh, declared by then President George Bush as part of the global uh, war on terror. Um, you see here, there's a banner, uh, there's a little sign, Filipino teachers against, uh, and scholars against the war. I had already started teaching um, at the University of San Francisco as a kind of a guest lecturer at the time, about to finish my PhD. Um, Amato was a young boy and he would come with me. Um, and you'll see here my little boy, uh, who is now a second grader, already uh, participating in rallies. This is uh, um, in, in response to kind of uh, President Trump and um, all of the anti-immigrant uh, sort of rhetoric uh, and immigrant rights rally that he came with. You can even, um, he was so little at the time, but I, I really wanted to end um, in particular with my with my older son. I think the younger one, his story has yet to unfold. The older one has an important story. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because his name was Amato. I say was because I lost my son and I'll tell you in a bit about that. But um, Amato actually means beloved. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I feel like today's talk is, is really one big love story because love really is at the core of Filipino American studies, at least for me. Um, 
uh, as I write in a forthcoming essay, uh, it is a love that is expansive, a love that emerges from and feeds into community, a love that is revolutionary for the world changing transformations it aims toward, love that is rooted in our collective history. It is love, therefore, that is radical. Radical meaning from the roots, a radical love that attempts to root out the structures that attempt to annihilate humanity, annihilate all life, a love that roots out the structures of heteropatriarchal, white supremacist, global capitalism and empire. For me, love, a feeling of intimate connection with communities, with students, with each other, for ourselves. Love must be at the center of a Pinai scholar activist praxis. Within the context of the ivory tower, that is the Western white supremacist heteropatriarchal university, love represents all that it is not. And so um, because of how much Filipino American studies is so deeply interwoven into my life, necessarily, as you can see here, uh, I've transferred it to my children. And, um, and, and I think that uh, it's my older son, you know, we've been able to see exactly what that meant for him. Um, Amano would actually end up becoming an activist in his own right. Um, you know, I, I love telling the story. Uh, he, uh, in high school, um, his first activist act probably was in when he walked out <laughs> on a European history class because he thought that te the teacher, he knew, he knew that the teacher was excluding um, um, histories of, of uh, communities of color because even a European history class, just like an American history class, needs to necessarily um, uh, involve, uh, you know, have uh, the stories of people of color. Um, but, you know, Amato uh, always put ideas into practice, this learning into practice. And among the things that he did was to return to the Philippines to learn from and stand beside indigenous peoples in the struggles. Um, but he tragically died while he was serving them uh, at the age of 22. Um, in, in 2020 at the height of the pandemic. I uh, just, you know, in his short life, Amado Kaya, which was his full first name, he led the reactivation of the Black Student Union at his high school uh, in connection to the growing Black Lives Matter movement, uh, a, sex, a successful anti-gentrification campaign is in his city of birth, Oakland, California, while he was a student at Laney Community College and also serving as a leader in Anakbay in East Bay. Amato Kai was a vocal advocate for ethnic studies, uh, immigrant workers' rights. Oh, the lights are going off in my office. <laughs> um, environmental justice. He was loved by, well loved by his family, friends, and the communities he served. Amato Kai has become an icon, really, for Gen Z, a really shining example of Vaidika love himself. And again, just to end this, because I hope we have time for questions. I have no idea what time we are, where we're at, but. I think if, if I hope you walk, walk away from anything from this talk is that Philippine American studies is us. It's personal and it's collective. It's about learning in and out of the classroom, learning in the family, um, learning from activists. Um, it's about putting ideas into practice. Knowledge isn't just for a degree. Filipino American studies isn't meant for just a degree, but person or and it's not for personal upward mobility. You know, so much of knowledge or college education is about what kind of degree are you going to have? What's it going to do for you? Um, you know, how does it promise upward, you know, economic mobility? But you know, the founders of Philippine American Studies, what for me too, um, knowledge isn't for that, but it's for a collective upliftment. At its core, Filipino American studies is about love. It's love for justice, love for ourselves love our community. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> and there's some resources after this. Uh, and then I'm just open to hear y'all and your questions. Thank you. Please help me give Dr. Rodriguez a round of applause, unmute or clap. Thank you so much, Robin, for your heartfelt, powerful story of love across generations. We do have some time for Q&A or comments, reactions, curiosities. If you would like to unmute, you're welcome to ask a question, share comments and or in the chat, both. We're here until four. 
lots lots of love coming in the chat as well robin and i see a hand from a friend patricia pa patricia azurin hi <laughs> hello um so i think amazing presentation i love hearing stories from people from our community because it's just really comforting to hear and um, I'm actually wondering if I could do a piece um, for a newspaper I write for um, called Mahalaya and we would love to do um, maybe a piece on your story it could be on um, your space in academia it could be um, on mental health too as well or um, anything really you would have to offer, we'd love to have something from you. So, yeah. Oh, I would be happy to. Thank you so much for thinking about um, asking to do a story about um, me or sort of these stories. But yeah, absolutely about mental health as well. I think one thing I may not have necessarily lifted up as much, I said it a little bit at the very beginning, but you know, I really, really believe that uh, Filipino American studies is uh, just deeply healing. Um, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> you know, um, my dad was hard, um, but Filipino American studies helped me to understand him and understand um, how hard it must have been for him um, as a sort of pioneer in his family to come to this country to know nobody. And um, to see his country of birth um, falling apart under a dictatorship. And, you know, and there was a lot he didn't know how to best express to his American born daughter. Um, and Philippine American Studies gave me the tools to understand that. So I think that's why it's so such an important part of who I am and why I can't confine it to this place. You know, UC Davis, it's a great institution, but it's really hard for people in our community to get in here. It's so expensive now to come to the UC system. I mean, even when I was an undergrad, I had to work three jobs, you know, um, to pay for tuition. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm still paying my debt from grad school, um, still, you know, um, so I don't want it to just be stuck here, uh, because I know that there's so much about, uh, Filipino American studies that can be so deeply transformational for people. Um, and even if it just starts with healing and mending, um, some of these, uh, traumas in our family, you know, um. I really, really believe that it's a beginning step for that. Thank you so thank much, you. Robin. And thank you for the question, Patricia. Um, I think that it's you raise a really important point about the power of healing, knowing self, knowing history, and ways in which the trauma of racism and classism colonialism, leaving leaving your home country to have to be forced to leave your home country to come here does have an impact on our, us, our community, our collective consciousness, and also our generations after us. There's a question in the chat from um, Dr. Winnie Hong about how- Hi, did, Winnie. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Hong, Dr. Winnie Hong, um, I'll just read it aloud. How do you maintain a loving outlook? in the face of institutional stonewalling and or gaslighting? And I think that's a great, great question too. Oh, it's a great question. And I'm not sure that I can say that I've been able to maintain a loving outlook all the time. Um, I mean, frankly, that's why, you know, uh, I am in the process of really um, exiting uh, this space. Uh, um, I, I will, con you know, we, and to try to grow, um, I, what I like to call Bulosan uh, 2.0, uh, 
um, you know, I will be, uh, we will continue to be able to maintain some of the work that we do here at the Blue Front Center. But the reality was, is we were going to necessarily have to constrict um, our activities here. They would have to um, really, oh, the light came on. Um, but to really reduce our activities, because uh, even though we were successful in advocating for an initial allocation uh, to jumpstart the center, it's been hard um, to continue uh, to get the, the kind of level of uh, financial support that we would need to be able to sustain the operations of our work. And we really haven't gotten um, a whole lot of support um, within this uh, space of the institution. We're still having to depend primarily on uh, donors from the community and grant writing, you know, um, on our own to bring in extra funds. And that's just a lot of energy expenditure. And frankly, too, you know, being here, the expectation is I, my primary focus or locus of activity is supposed to be still meant to be UC Davis it's the, and its community. And that's not really where um, I want to be. So um, we're in a process of transition, trying to figure out how to both keep a, a foothold um, at the institution while also uh, bloom or uh, sort of grow Filipino studies outside of it. Now, maintaining a loving outlook, I guess part of it too is, you know, I, I've always been a community organizer. I've never stopped being a community organizer. Everywhere I've gone, I've tried to connect with some form of community or collectivity or where it didn't exist, create one. Um, you know, more in recently uh, or in the Sacramento region, of course, I've been part, I helped to form the uh, Asian American Liberation Network. And now I, I serve as the board chair. I am very active. I'm the uh, president of the Filipino American um, Educators Association of California, which is uh, gonna celebrate its 30th year next year. Um, you know, Before this, when I was living in New Jersey, I was working very closely with the immigrant rights movement um, in the town where I was living. So I think for me, um, as long as I maintain these commitments outside of the university, in these social justice spaces and also draw boundaries around my work. You know, I try really hard to shut off by six o'clock um, um, so that I could be present with my family. Um, those are the sorts of things. But I think being embedded in community because so much of the institution, especially academia, is about individual um, achievement, right? Whether it, you know, it's about students going off to get their degrees, or even you as a scholar, right? It's all about how much you have published, how much you do. Um, if you do things um, kind of, it, it, it's, community work is not a value, right? But I think uh, well, I've been able to maintain my outlook by doing all the things that the institution doesn't value. <laughs> because if it doesn't value it, it's because those value, this institution doesn't align with my values. And if I do the work that um, is meaningful to me, um, that is how I can maintain um, this sort of outlook. So, yeah. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate your insights and perspective and how you're creating and building and connecting. We have just a couple more minutes left if there are other questions or comments uh, from the chat or on, on um, mute, please feel free. I, Dr. Robin, I, um, Rodriguez, I don't really have a question, but just want to thank you. Um, as a as an immigrant um, who lived through the Marcus reign and lived through Etsa coming in 1991, so I just want to thank you for uh, um, continue uh, telling our story, continue empowering our, um, our community. So appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for all the work that uh, you and everyone else is doing. Um, you know, uh, the, so it's such important work that y'all are doing with uh, the end of PZ um, funding and just really, uh, you know, advocating for API uh, students and staff even uh, at CRC. Yeah, thank you so much, Robin. Where else can we see you or find you this month? I know there's a variety of, um, events and really historical opportunities, moments that are happening in, in, in this month. Yeah, well, the big, big thing that's super exciting is next Friday is the, uh, not Friday, Saturday is the official launch of the California is in the Heart exhibition at the California Museum. 
in Sacramento. This is the very first time that the California Museum has done an exhibition on the Filipino experience in California. We were so fortunate to be one of the co-curators. So super, super excited that that's happening. It's gonna be opening next week, which is awesome because um, there's gonna be vendors and music. It's gonna be totally celebratory. Um, but if you can't make it this Saturday, though I really encourage you to go to Saturday, um, there is the exhibition lasts for six months and we're gonna have lots of different programming at the museum in connection to the exhibition throughout the entirety of the six months. Um, so please be there. Um, in terms of resources, this is now the second year that I, uh, my team uh, created a FAM, our Filipino American History Month resource guide for folks that's kind of, kind of meant for folks in the Sacramento region. The link is there. Um, so y'all can uh, take that. It's a really, we, we were able to build off of uh, resource guides that other folks have, have made um, throughout the Bay Area. Um, of course, tomorrow is a big fam fest in Stockton. Uh, I won't be able to be there. I have family obligations, but you know, if you wanted to get my books and you wanted to hang out and have some fun because it's gonna be a fun event, it seems like, fam fest is happening tomorrow in Stockton. Um, and yeah, you know, please check out my website for any of the books I've done or opportunities to learn. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I've never been really great about social media. I always joke, it's like, y'all, how can I get on social media and be posting all sorts of stuff when I'm in meetings in the community or writing books? But I'm trying to transition into trying to translate some of the stuff because I've seen it on, you know, there's that's like a lot of great content creation on Instagram, um, which is fantastic. And, and it's great that young folks are getting a lot of their information there. But I feel like there's, a, there's also lots of other kinds of information that isn't yet being circulating. Um, that's circulating in, in kind of social media that hopefully I'll be able to uh, better contribute to. Um, but there's all sorts of different things there. And um, it's just, I hope this is just a start. If you haven't been doing kind of Filipino American studies, maybe this piques your interest and, and you can dive a little deeper beyond just um, the limits of, you know, the month of October. Yes, you're here. Thank you so much for um, your friendship with us. We appreciate our ongoing relationship and connection to you, your powerful and emotional story and willingness to be vulnerable with us is also um, truly appreciative. We, we are sending you a virtual hug and fist bump and fist in the air to support the ongoing organizing and activism and resources in our region and, and across the country and abroad. We thank you so much for your time and being with us. I want to thank the organizers for today, um, the departments that helped make this possible, all of you for spending the afternoon with us. I hope you feel um, um, inspired and motivated and refueled to continue to be partners for Filipino American Studies, to ask for it, enroll in it, join the School of Liberating Education with Dr. Rodriguez, um, and support in any way you can, fam, um, this month and every day of the year. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll make this recording available probably on CRC's Center for Professional Development website. So um, we have your registration. If you registered, we'll try to send something out to you all as well with the link and maybe the resources that have been provided in the chat. Have an awesome weekend. We hope Just to see you at FAM Fest, right? Raul, go ahead. Back to Raul. Yeah. Sorry. Just one reminder that we will have our last of the uh, speaker series next thursday um uh from 3 to 4 30 please come join us and i uh, welcome dr uh, anthony um uh, christian ocampo for um uh, uh for his speech again thank you for joining us today thank you everyone follow up uh patricia <laughs> if you want to talk thank you again for taking interest and in, for everybody who helped uh, with this event sabrina claire thank you and it's great to see all sorts of uh, friends here. Nikki, Eugene, um, yeah, Eugene, Madeline. Yeah, I saw um, Connolly from Canada. Mark, always good to see you. Kabang, um, one of our inter. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this has been lovely seeing all of you, and can't wait to see y'all in person soon. Thank yes. you.